Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back with another of our 5 Minute Histories videos and today I'm down on the waterfront in the Canton Waterfront Park and if you've ever come down here to a concert or strolled along the promenade you certainly will have noticed the big hulking beast behind me and wondered what in the world is going on. It's kind of like Baltimore's industrial Arc de Triomphe but instead of having its feet planted on the Champs-Élysées in Paris it's got its feet firmly in the water here in the harbor and what is going on is that it was part of a railroad transfer bridge that got railroad cars from one side of the harbor to the other, put them on barges and floated them across, but we'll get that get to that in a second. I want to say a quick thanks to the city's Historic Preservation Commission. They did a great report on this bridge, which I'm using uh, for this video, and also to Dr. Ray Barr. Dr. Barr for years has been a tireless researcher and writer and champion of Canton and its history and importance, and it's because of Dr. Barr that this uh, railroad transfer bridge got on our radar screens and is now a historic landmark, so thanks so much. All right, so the first question is, why would anybody want to float railroad cars across the harbor? And to answer that, let's turn back to 1828. And that's when the Canton Company of Baltimore was formed. It was a real estate development operation. They purchased 3,000 acres of Captain O'Donnell's estate. And they built houses, but they also built iron works and, uh, and railroads. And here along the water, they leased out property to canneries and breweries and ships builders. And right here in what the park is now, they leased out uh, land for a railroad yard to the Philadelphia Wilmington and Baltimore Railroad. It was one of the earlier railroads. I think it got started in the 1830s, connecting Philadelphia and Baltimore carrying passengers and freight. Incidentally, one of the passengers that it carried on one day was Frederick Douglass. He escaped from his enslavement by getting on a train and heading north, but that's another story. Um, so the railroad yard here you would think would be the end of the tracks, and in some ways it was. It was where trains stopped and unloaded or loaded up directly onto boats. In Baltimore's uh, heyday of importing bananas, there were thousands of pounds of bananas that were unloaded from boats here onto railroad cars uh, up to kids waiting impatiently in ice cream shops for their banana splits. Um, but in some ways it was not the end of the tracks as train cars were loaded onto barges, floated across the water, and then unloaded at the other end on Locust Point. It was sort of a, uh, a continuation of the tracks. So the other question then is, well, why couldn't you just go through downtown with your trains? And the first answer to that is that downtown prohibited uh, uh, locomotives from going through those big polluting beasts. So if you wanted to go through downtown, you would have to stop on the outskirts, uh, uncouple your train, hitch up to horses and pull your cars through one at a time. That was slow and expensive. The Pennsylvania Railroad had figured out a solution by tunneling under downtown, which was good for the Pennsylvania Railroad, but not so good for everybody else. Not so much because the Pennsylvania was stingy, but because they, between their freight traffic and passenger traffic, they were using the tunnels for their own cars almost every minute of the day. Um, so uh, companies, train companies like the Pennsylvania uh, Wilmington and or Philadelphia Wilmington and Baltimore Railroad uh, really had no other choice. So the, the next question is, well, how did this thing work? What was going on? And uh, the answer is that it was part of a system where you put train cars from piers onto barges and then floated them across. The barges were fitted out with railroad tracks. Um, and the problem was you couldn't just pull your barge right up to the end of the pier uh, because of tides. Sometimes your barge might be a little bit higher than the pier, maybe a little bit lower, maybe a lot lower. So you needed to somehow bridge the gap. And that's where this contraption comes in. If you've ever been on a passenger ferry, think of when you docked, there was a gangplank. A couple crew members put out a gangplank to connect you on the boat with the dock. Um, and that's basically the same thing that happened here. It allows for a connection where the boat can bob around or go up and down with the tides, uh, but still connect to the dry land. If you were on a passenger ferry, a couple crew members could probably handle the gangplank. But if your gangplank had railroad ties on it, tracks on it, and, uh, and carried a fully loaded freight car, um, you needed more than a couple men to do that. And that's where this contraption came in with engines and pulleys. It was essentially an industrial uh, gangplank lifter, if you will. 
So the barge would pull up, the gangplank would get lowered down and aligned with the, uh, with the barge, and then men would put giant steel rods in there to secure it, and the freight train would be rolled onto the barge, hopefully not tipping too much side to side, um, decoupled, floated across the locust point, and then the operation would uh, start all over again. We were not the pioneers here in Baltimore of railroad transfer bridges. That happened just a little bit north of here in Haverty Grace, uh, connecting Haverty Grace and Perryville at the mouth of the Susquehanna River uh, at the northern tip of the bay. Railroad companies were uh, desperate to find a short route between points north and uh, Baltimore and points south. And a couple railroads, including the um, uh, Camden and Amboy Railroad, pioneered this idea of a transfer bridge. The other railroad that pioneered it was none other than our own uh, Philadelphia, Wilmington and Baltimore Railroad. Um, so they were, uh, they were early adopters, and when they got here, uh, they knew what they were doing. Um, there were railroad transfer bridges all f over the Chesapeake Bay, but the undisputed king of transfer bridges was New York City. In its heyday, on a busy day, it had 90 transfer bridges that were hauling 6,000 railroad cars over the Hudson River between New York and New Jersey uh, every day. All right, I'm going to wrap up and say that we still have three transfer bridges in Baltimore. In addition to this, this one, there are two on the other side of the harbor in Locust Point. They were operated by the B&O Railroad, and you can only see them from the water. So if you haven't ever seen them, you're, uh, you're forgiven, but they're over there too. But this one uh, stands proudly right on the, uh, the shore's edge, uh, right off of the Canton Waterfront uh, Park, gloriously telling its industrial past as, Baltim as part of Baltimore's uh, Great Railroad heritage. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.